Action sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engines running. We have a liftoff. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Welcome once again, folks, to PCKC TV Cosplay Corner, Cosplay Crafters. Uh, we're going to be here with Tim Harrison of HDC Fabrication. But first, let's say uh, thank you to our sponsors, uh, U.S. Toy Costume and or Magic and Costume Shop. Uh, man, we've got lots of great products that are coming into the store. Uh, we're going to talk about those a little bit through the broadcast here. Uh, but we definitely want to thank Lisa and her team for giving us the opportunity to broadcast here on uh, Planet Comic Con's uh, Facebook page. And then let's say thanks to our other sponsors here. We've got NFM, Boulevard Brewing Company, U.S. Armor, KCWE, Geico, UMB Bank, Xfinity, 5-Hour Energy, T-Mobile, Kansas City Mavericks, Kansas City Live, and the great state of Oklahoma. All right. Well, today we're here with Tim Harrison of HDC Fabrication. Uh, Tim, tell us, just you got a lot of great stuff going on there. What's HDC Fabrication? What Thank do we you. need to know uh, about you? So we do a lot of primarily custom fabrication work, either for cosplay, collectors, a lot of industry work. Uh, we'll make everything from basic smaller props to small printed signs for like labels and things like that upwards to full armor builds full replica kind of work uh, a lot of multimedia work as well so foams traditional sculpting uh, we work with uh, 3d printing uh, fused filament and resin sculpting uh, digital sculpting a lot of molding and casting techniques leather work foam smithing uh, pretty much everything that we can do to bring something from either a, a designer's mind or a particular genre uh video game movie whatever uh we take all of all of those skill sets and apply them to bring that essentially fantasy to life nice how, how did you get your uh start in in costume construction and in cosplay so always ever since i was a, a little wee lad i uh, was always into taking things apart making things with their rector sets or legos or uh some of the old school radio shack kits that they used to have and throughout the years just continued to make things for school projects or just uh messing around with some friends in the garage uh playing with I think I tried to make an electric scooter once when I was in high school, uh, rebuilding a buddy's 52 Jeep Willys. Uh, and then through college, kind of took a break a little bit. Still a couple things to kind of apply the, the art skills to. And then uh, about 2012 or so, I decided I wanted to start making some things again. Uh, always being a big fan of Halloween, uh, I wanted to do some steampunk stuff for Halloween. So that's kind of what reignited the flame. All I really knew, uh, I've also been a big fan of Tesla for ages. So mm -hmm. hopping on the steampunk side, I knew I wanted to take one of those nice little USB plasma balls and throw it in a pistol. And mm -hmm. uh, that's what I did. I made two sets of guns for Halloween and that was pretty much the end of the story. Through that, I found uh, the steampunk convention scene and started doing presentations there. I had gone to some general comic conventions in the past, uh, Chicago Comic Con in I think 2007 or 2008 before Wizard World took over, and it was before a lot of the cosplay stuff was around, so I just kind of forgot about it. And then through Steampunk in 2012, 13, 14, and then branching out in about 2016, started doing some competition stuff, and uh, that, was, that was it. That's pretty much got me hooked. Um, Excellent. And uh, now it's what I do. <laughs> Very cool. Well, I, I'm sure through the steampunk community, we have a lot of mutual friends. Uh, oh, yeah. A lot of friends out in California and, and everywhere else. So it's it's nice to be able to meet you. But I also 
I have been looking forward to today because we're both huge Star Wars nerds. Yes. And uh, yes. today we're going to be talking a little bit about your Mandalorian builds and everything that goes along with that. And I mean, we can just see the beauty right there in the background. That's <laughs> that's pretty fantastic. Well, thank you. Um, uh, oh, go ahead. Well, sorry. What? Why don't you tell me a little bit more about what you do with with HDC? You said you do some stuff for movies. Yeah, we've done uh, some independent films. Uh, we've also worked with uh, the local uh, 476 uh, Film and Studio Mechanics Union uh, for the Chicago film industry. We've done some work with them. Uh, some really, some really cool uh, indie indie films uh, based out of Indianapolis. One's revolved around the death of Robin. One's a uh, complete uh, sci-fi universe, um, and both both productions are fantastic and great people to work with. Uh, enjoyed doing the stuff with the Robin fan film, just because Marvel comic back uh, DC nerd, uh, more Marvel, but it was still great to make the DC Robin armor, and it was just a, a lot of fun to do, a lot of great working with the productions. Sure. Well, hey, you sent us a couple of those pictures. Oh, Listen, yeah. can we show those off? So, okay, tell me about this build a little bit. What? Because that's a little bit different. Uh, Robin armor than what we've seen in the past is is that something that was called for out of a comic? It's uh, a little bit of uh, custom work. Um, we we designed the patterns for that completely in shot with a little bit of inspiration from the Arkham Asylum games. Uh, they have a little bit more of a, a tactile or um, a tactical and uh, kind of real world feel to them, and they do a lot of cool design work as well. Uh, that's completely made out of EVA foam. Uh, specifically, uh, Steve SKS props his foam. That was our first uh -huh. uh, first big build with his foam when he first released everything. So it was really nice to get some hands on and spend some some time with that. Cut in all the details after the assembly was put into place. Then we uh, seal the foam with uh, neoprene rubber called Creature Cast, and it's. Okay. Uh, Kind of similar to plasti paste and things like that, but being a neoprene, it's sandable, which is really really nice for post processing. Processing, excuse me, which is uh, allows you to get a much smoother finish than uh, possibly spraying things. It also gives you a little bit of forgiveness with uh, any spraying mistakes and uh, being more of an industry house with. Uh, industry style painting equipment and things like that it allows us to buy in bulk so we get to save some money as well and then uh, okay. go ahead sorry so the the the, the product there you, is called creature cast that's a neoprene yes yeah it's a it's okay sealant similar to plasti paste or not plasti paste okay. excuse me plasti dip uh-huh excellent and there's the robin in action there yes that's one Did of the also... go ahead uh, it's one of the uh, back um, behind the scenes shots they took from the first film that was released last year. Uh, I think it'll uh, it's by uh, B Squared Productions, and it'll actually be a part of the virtual indie popcoms uh, fan film festival. And they're filming the sequel to it right now, which is really cool. Nice. Is, so, go ahead and spoil a little bit. No, don't spoil it. But man, I really want to know if that's the Tim Drake, Robin, or what storyline that goes along. We'll worry about that later. Okay. So that that's all real cool. I do. I I, I think that's just fantastic work with the mask and and with the armor. You know, it. We do. Uh, I I do need to to pay some bills here real quick, and make sure that we point out there at uh, U.S. Toy we have what's called the uh, stick effects, uh, silicone mask. And we've got about eight different designs there in the store. Uh, mind, don't mind the bad camera work that I just put forth there. I was hoping to process it a little bit later. Uh, but, you know, red and blue and black in a couple of different styles. So drop on in. They retail for about $24.99. But you can save with PCC Live 20 through October 31st. And if what I'm hearing is true, it sounds like we're going to be doing a couple more cosplay contests. Uh, through Planet Comic Con, so you might want to go ahead and start putting together your potential builds. Uh, so come check us out in the store there. Okay, Tim. Sweet. Mandalorian armor. <laughs> Tell me about starting it, about what you used, how you made it, uh, and some of the tools and everything else. Like, uh, you, you said you've got a helmet there. 
that yeah. uh, is, is uh, raw? So here is, uh, this is one of the raw prints. Um, the almost straight off the printer. Uh, this entire set is 3D printed. Uh, we're actually in the process of remaking it right now. Uh, this uh, The initial display was put together for uh, our C2E2 display. So if anybody uh, was at C2 and happy to uh, actually saw it, thank you for stopping by. Uh, but it's all entirely 3D printed. A uh, combination of um, the, the more readily available fused filament uh, printing and then some resin printing as well. We use the uh, first a lot of sanding. Uh, if you guys aren't familiar with with 3D printing, it's uh, all these texture lines from all the layers. Uh, so it pretty much with, with the fused filament 3D printers, you essentially have a glue gun on a CNC access, and it just makes loops and loops and stacks layers upon layers on top of each other. So in order to get a nice smooth mirror finish, there's a lot of sanding and a lot of post-processing. Uh, let me see. Uh, do you so. do you have a specific tool or anything in particular that you enjoy using while sanding? Uh, yeah, there's, uh, when we're not hand sanding, there's a, a really great detail company called Proxim with two X's. Uh, I think it's originally a German manufacturer, but they've got a distribution center in uh, Pennsylvania, I think it is. Uh, but it's a, it's a nice little delta sander, um, so it's got the nice small triangle head, and it really takes a lot of the strain and time when you're sanding for hours and hours a day uh, by hand versus using using that tool. They've got some other precision sanders as well, so it's uh, it's a really great great thing to invest in. They are about 150 bucks. Uh, they make other companies make less expensive delta sanders, but uh, I like this one because it's a it's a real beast of a workhorse. So you can continue to run it all day, seven days a week if you really need to, not having to worry about a burnout. Wow, very cool. Dustin, uh, I, I want to make sure to say thank you to Dustin Evans Photography. He is running behind the scenes for us, producing the show. Uh, but he's put up links to those uh, Delta Sanders from Proxim uh, for you, the audience, to take a look at. We do have uh, 50. We do have a number of people watching, so go ahead and send in uh, any questions. I'm sorry I interrupted. Uh, you were just about to talk about the uh, shoulder pauldron right there. Oh, um, so I, just, I pulled this off because it's probably one of the easiest things to pull off behind me right now, but just to kind of show the, the difference of right off the printer, if you can see those detail, like all those layer lines versus the... Um, the, the almost mirror finish you can kind of see in that reflection. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, if you aren't familiar with 3D printing finishing, uh, it takes a lot of time. And if you are familiar with 3D print finishing, then you understand how much time it takes. So it's uh, one, of, one of the things that I, aside from being a giant nerd and loving the show, um, I, I enjoy complex finishes like this and the challenge to bring that finish to life um, for a display piece. Uh, and it was uh, just a really, really rewarding process um, between me and then our team to bring this whole, whole thing together in three weeks was uh, a challenge, but glad that we were able to do it. So now we're going yeah, back that's and uh, taking some time to redo everything, update some things for accuracy, and go from there. That Yeah, that's a pretty quick turnaround. Hey, uh, why did you decide to go with uh, 3D printing instead of using uh, more foam to make the uh, the helmet and everything out of? A uh, few, few different reasons. Uh, I, I enjoy foam. It's a great, great product. Uh, with a lot of the Star Wars work that we do, uh, we also make things compatible with the uh, 501st costume group, Rebel Legion costume group, um, and their specifications mm -hmm. for submission. And they don't allow foam because um, it's a soft background, even though you can give it that kind of rigid appearance. Uh, another thing was that I was able to outsource the file designs to save time uh, without keeping everything in-house because we did have that three-week turnaround. 
so that was a, that was another big reason. Um, also, just to showcase some different multimedium techniques between the 3D print finishing, um, the leather work, and all that stuff. Uh, this also corresponds with kind of how they did things with the show. So a few, a few different. Right a lot of it was time. Um, uh huh. But yeah, it's all sorts of different ways you can do this kind of stuff. Sure, absolutely. There's always more than one way to skin a cat. Oh yeah. Uh, tell, can you tell us a little bit about the process that you went through to get that finish? Because it's it's absolutely beautiful. But I don't want you to give away any trade secrets if you're making oh. money off of stuff. No, it's uh, the way the way I see it. The more we share about how we're doing things, the better we can develop the community. So it's uh, I can tell you guys how to do everything how you want, but it's still a matter of practice and skill development in order to get things things in place. So it's the more that we can help mm -hmm. the community, the more I I would I'd rather share. Um, so again, it's a lot of sanding. Uh, typically what we'll do is with the raw prints for this kind of reflective finish, uh, we'll take the raw print and go uh, 120 grit, uh, excuse me, 80 grit to 120 grit to 220 grit on the, the Proxen hand sander. Uh, once that is done, then I will uh, use an HVLP gun similar to uh, this guy and spray a two-part catalyzed urethane primer filler. Um, what that does is, uh, being a high-build primer filler, um, any of those residual cracks and things like that, it'll help fill in when you go to send that second sanding phase. Um, being a urethane, it also adds a little bit of durability to the print. So that's done, and then we'll go through and start sanding again. We'll do a... Uh, 220 on the, the Proxen sander, and then I'll do uh, three, I believe it's a 320 grit, and then a 400 grit by hand. And once I hit that, I'll start back at the 400 grit and then start a process called uh, wet sanding, which is uh, using sandpaper and water in conjunction to help wash away the, uh, the dust and things like that. And it allows you to get a much smoother finish. So we'll do- okay. Could, uh, could you could you go into that process real quick? Cause yeah, of course. That's something like I, I know of wet forming with leather, but this is the first I've heard of, of uh, wet sanding. So it's uh, pretty much just like regular sanding, except you're using the wet sandpaper or spraying it in paper, and it, it pretty much just uses the water as a lubricant, essentially, to more easily wash away the debris that you're sanding off. Um, and it's uh, an essential, an essential step when you're doing uh, at least 3D printed stuff for us. Pretty much everything. It's just a matter of to the degree of grit that we're using, uh, depending upon the finishes. So with this, with this particular finish, we'll do the uh, the 400, 600, 800, 1000. Then we'll do 1250, 1500, and 2000, all wet sanding. Uh, and then we'll wow. do a base uh, a sealer coat over that. Um, the Createx Auto Airline is a fantastic product. It's water-based, but uh, allows you to add some of that automotive durability with their 4030 additive and then just the base product alone. Uh, with not super reflective stuff like this, uh, we'll pretty much just typically wet sand to 800, 1000 grit. Um, and then we'll go through and do the base coat and then for this, we'll do a uh, catalyzed clear coat on top of that to do the gloss. And then we'll spray uh, uh, Imperial Surface Aluma Luster is the actual paint they used in the show. Uh, it's a wonderful industry grade paint, but it also comes with that industry grade price. Uh, it's any of the metallics in uh, all the Marvel movies and uh, like the Aquaman suit in DC, it's all used this paint as a base as well. Um, so after that, we'll get get this nice mirror finish, then we'll spray the catalyzed clear coat on top of that, give it a final buff and polish, and then do all our distressing work with uh, oil paints. Okay, well, let me let me just ask this question. There's a lot of sanding and a yes. lot of going back and re-sanding. How much of the original print is done by the time you got all the extra layers and sanding and everything else on there? Um, is it okay. still pretty much the base? It's... Yeah, it's still, um, you can kind of see it on here. Uh, there's still about a quarter inch of, 
of 3D print in there. Um, we primarily use PETG, uh, so it's got a higher heat tolerance than uh, standard PLA and PLA plus, which are like the most common filaments used. But uh, it's also a little harder, so it sands a lot easier. So that aids in the process. And uh, but it it's pretty much just a lot of sanding. Uh, yeah. Pros Anything to get that that clear, you know, you've done a wonderful job on getting that almost mirror finish on there. And, and, and so, yeah, it's got to just be as smooth as silver. So um, how dare I ask how many hours of sanding, how many hours of, of actual production within that three weeks did that went into that suit? Uh, I didn't keep track. Um, mm -hmm. But so we... C2E2 was February 27th. I think I started printing January 30th. Uh, and then wow. between um, the shop assistants and everything, there was, I would say, a few hundred man hours between the armor and then the leather work and then the weapons uh, in order to get things done. So there is some long days. Uh, some long days. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So uh, tell me a little bit about the weapons. You've got you've got the disintegrator rifle back there. Is oh, that um, is that puppy full? All of these, every, everything on this is 3D printed. Um, uh -huh. So again, uh, this is his pistol. Uh, for these file sets, we used uh, a modeler uh, by the name of Red Props, who has done some work for us. Um, mm -hmm. Again, all all 3D printed stuff. The grips are walnut, uh, a little lighter than the initial ones, but for our next version, we are doing a darker setup. Um, so this is all 3D printed. Uh, for some of the smaller detail pieces, we did use uh, masked SLA printing, which is a newer resin technology. Um, this giant beast of a rifle is also 3D printed. Uh, this one was a bit rushed because we didn't actually paint it until about a day and a half before the convention, but uh, it still came together pretty well, and for the turnaround time, I'm pretty happy with it. But it's, uh, again, 3D printed with a combination of uh, resin and uh, the fused filament printing techniques as well, um, and some magnet mounting parts. Uh, and then... My favorite, uh, which is actually one of the newest weapons um, that we've been working on and uh, redesigning for accuracy, is his grav charge. Um, this one is entirely resin 3D printed. Uh, again, models by Red Props. Um, this one and a few of the weapons, but this one in particular, we worked. Uh, very close with him to refine the details and accuracy and get all the size in place. Uh, it's also got a uh, custom design electronics that we did for um, for this simultaneous blinking effect. So a lot of I've apparently got a a thing for blinky explosive devices from Star Wars. <laughs> uh, well, they're so neat. So they're, they are that, neat. that board, <laughs> that board that you that you put those LEDs on, uh, is is that something you fabricated yourself, or is that something people can get in touch with online? Or uh, this is a, a custom design by us in shop. Um, so the board was designed, and then we had it uh, printed on a PCB or a printed circuit board printing company. Uh -huh. Can't really, it's not focusing. That it's well. hard to tell. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, it's a really basic circuit. Um, it's an old school 555 timer circuit, uh, which if you're familiar with electronics, it's just a, the, the 555 timer is a, a very well used and loved integrated circuit that uh, has a lot of different versatility. But if you're doing basic blinking effects and things like that, um, it's very, very useful. Uh, but a lot of the pre-made stuff that I wanted to do to get this 
uh, practical effect in place uh, didn't exist for simultaneous blinking, and I didn't want to use an Arduino. So it was just a matter of uh, making this custom board and going from there. That's neat. You know, as, as much as I try, as much of a fan of science I am, I am no good at practical electronics. I can talk theory all day long, but I, I can't solder. I can't do any of the, the neat stuff uh, to put things together. So I really respect the, the actual fabrication of uh, putting those things together. Um, so, hey, I want to take a quick second here uh, to pay the bills again. Uh, Dustin, could you bring up the uh, picture there, the Rockstar wigs? So here's a selection of, of Rockstar wigs that we've got in the store. They're all lace front wigs. I don't think you need to play it as a video, but you know, go ahead. Uh, but we got a wide selection into the store. We are open from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, Sunday through Saturday. So you can come every day of the week, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. And we've got someone there in the store who can help you out. Those Rockstar wigs are heat resistant, uh, but they, uh, they curl up real nice. Uh, and they last. The, the durability is just absolutely amazing with them. So some of them are lace front, some of them are not. Uh, but we've we've added those to our already large selection of wigs. So come on in and check those out, as well as our selection. You can see the Pro Air products right below them. All right. So Tim, the, one of the questions we've been asking every you know once a week here is, if budget were no problem. If, if you had all the money and resources, oh, man. what would your dream build be? That's a tough question. Uh, I've been I've been thinking, so I, I try to compile lists, and I've got a short attention span, so that list continues to grow and then also just completely diverges. But uh, I haven't competed. I haven't competed in a while, so I've been trying to think of something that I can do uh, for uh, competition to kind of uh, further challenge my skill sets and then build from there. Uh, my last, like aside from this, my last complex build was uh, Project Edmund Blade um, by Zach Fisher from BlizzCon 2018. We were part of that original group and we did uh, Varian Win, which was uh, one of probably the most complex designs they did for that. And again, like a two month turnaround time. So I've been kind of using that as a basis to figure out what I want to do. And with a combination of printing and finishing techniques, practical effects, uh, traditional sculpting, and uh, I've been wanting to do more uh, silicone prosthetic uh, casting and things like that, mm -hmm. I decided to go back to my StarCraft roots and I want to make a one-to-one -one scale Artanis. Okay. From, right he's, the, he's the leader of the Protoss race. Uh, the Protoss by themselves stand about nine feet. And Artanis, he's got this big kind of tuning fork thing on the back, uh, which puts him in about probably 11 feet or so. Um, I haven't done a large build like that either, so it's another reason that I wanted to, because it'll involve uh digi stilts it'll involve making a bodysuit it'll involve uh doing a full custom sculpt for his head and his hands Got a lot of custom lighting effects um another kind of crazy finish similar to this uh they're the the futuristic race of starcraft if you're not familiar with it so they've got a, a uh very clean white and blue color scheme a lot of whites but still Still subtleties in dirt and grime and battle damage, which I really enjoy implementing on the build. So uh, that's kind of what I settled on. I don't know when it's going to happen, but uh, I don't know what the budget's going to be for it. But that's mm -hmm. that's my next big goal. <laughs> sure, sure. So, so you know, you've been competing for a while, uh, and let's let's talk a little bit about that process. How do you choose where and when and what to compete in? Uh, it's. I like to choose a a complex costume that goes on uh, multiple skill sets, uh, multiple mediums. Something that challenges me, but something that I can 
implement cleanly that also shows a lot of detail uh, for competition work and then just our general shop work. Uh, if you're familiar with it, there's a thing called the 10 foot rule, which we kind of throw out the window. And the goal is to essentially create everything as it's used as a hero prop. So something that has all those fine details, if you're an inch away from the build, uh, everything still looks super clean. Uh, something that uh, showcases those little details. Um, it's, yeah, I guess the biggest, I'm kind of starting to repeat myself. The biggest thing is uh, a lot of high detail work that can be cleanly implemented and uh, multi-medium. So uh, again, well done electronics, lighting, sound effects, smoke effects, uh, painting details, needlework stuff, sculpting, printing. Um, and it's all stuff that, I've, that I should be able to implement well uh, especially from being in the judging circuit as well. There's, uh, I get a lot of questions about using a technique just to use a technique, um, which I don't think you should do. It's just something that if you're going to implement it, make sure you implement it well and that it also fits your build. Uh, there's been some things that we have seen where people use this really awesome technique, but it doesn't fit the character. Uh, and it kind of stands out on its own. So long story short, um, detailed multimedia uh, skills that we can implement cleanly. That's typically what I go for, and then also tries to get some new stuff in there. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and you mentioned you're on the judging circuit, and you're one of the judges for Planet Comic Con the next time we have it. Um, so what should cosplayers in our area know about you as a cosplay judge and, and, and how to gain your favor? Is it, do you look at a, out of other cosplayers, what you try to set up for yourself or do you have a different judging philosophy? Uh, I, as, as a judge, uh, I don't play favorites. Um, even friends who I have judged, uh, know that very well. Um, being a detail oriented uh, fabricator, I I get very up close with permission, of course, uh, to look at the details and the fabrication techniques used by the costumer. Um, one thing that I'm kind of fortunate is I've I've gotten pretty good at isolating techniques just with like a kind of a, a quick look and feel. So I guess as someone who wants to compete, um, again, number one, don't be afraid to compete. It's, it, is, it is a stressful process, especially on a craftsmanship uh, competition stage, but just be proud of what you make no matter what level that you compete at. Make sure it's implemented well. Uh, make sure to use your, your skill sets well. Never be afraid to ask questions. And if you have any questions regarding a judging process or something like that, uh, reach out to the convention, uh, be it Planet or another convention that you're curious about uh, competing at. But um, me specifically, I look at clean details, implemented skill sets, uh, what skill sets were used, uh, and then depending upon the level of craftsmanship that we're judging, um, both inside and out. A lot of times when you get to the higher levels of competing, it gets to a point where you need to try to find things that are wrong versus awesome things that were implemented. So at that point, things like if you're using practical effects, clean wire management, uh, cleanly done internal armor for foam or printing, uh, leather work, clean leather work, um, clean needlework, if make, uh, the biggest thing with a lot of needlework and armor stuff, especially over the last few years, is uh, people have been upset looking on the inside of foam armors and things like that for competition. But it's if we're looking at clean seam work and internal lining and things like that, just to make sure that the inside is clean as well, it's something that we need to carry through to all the other mediums that are out there um, as well. 
just because the skills that everybody are bringing to competitions, it's it's crazy how much it's grown even since when I've started. It's just each year it exponentially gets harder and harder and there's more advanced skills being used. There's a lot cleaner techniques in especially in the master level, but depending upon the competition you're at, you've got these single people that are bringing, uh, single competitors that are bringing uh, just these movie quality, replica grade, in crazy pieces of art uh, to the competition. And when you've got 20 people in the same level bringing that that kind of quality work, it, it's uh, it's awesome to see, but man, does it make our job hard as judges. So that's sure. Uh, that's when we have to start getting down to the nitty gritty, um, fine detail stuff, how things were implemented, and just go from there. I think I got a little off track. So hopefully that answered. No, that. no, absolutely. That's that, that's great information. I do want to talk about some of the stuff that I see off off to your left shoulder. I want to say, um, <coughs> is that. Vegeta's armor that I see up there? That is. Uh, I can bring him down if you want. Yeah, let's take a look at him. What's this? Get rid of the hat. Little tri corner there, nice. Oh! This is also foam. <laughs> uh huh. This was done, uh, the first iteration of this was done, uh, I was judging Anime Central in 2018, their Masquerade, mm -hmm. and I wanted a new costume for it, so I, for some reason, so the contest was on Saturday, uh, I started patterning this on <laughs> Thursday, uh, so uh, the next day and a half, I pulled the first iteration of this together. And then uh, two years ago, I think, for OhioCon in Indiana, I wanted to kind of correct some of the speedily done pattern issues with like length. And then I had to add the little curve in here, added some more of the battle damage and things like that um, for his, uh, his DBZ look. Um, I can't remember. I, I keep getting Cell Saga and Frieza Saga confused, so I... I don't remember where he got this, but I also enjoy doing battle damage. But this is all uh, TNT cosplay supply foam, but again, the sure. same uh, same neoprene rubber creature cast sealant and uh, Createx Auto Air paints uh, for the white and the metallic, and then oils again for the distressing. Nice. But he's fun. Hey, I, since I love Vegeta. Since you just mentioned him. I'm I'm going to go ahead and uh, pull our third third advertisement, our third bill. Um, hey, Dustin, we've got a shot there of the TNT cosplay foam that's now Ooh. available at U.S. Toy Costume and Magic. We've got several different sizes of rolls and a number of the dowels there as well. Great, great prices on those. Check out our Facebook and Instagram posts for exact prices. And, of course, use the PCC Live 20 to save even more on the TNT cosplay foam. Uh, unfortunately, we can't get any of the SKS uh, foam because he's got that uh, awesome agreement with uh, Bic Art. You can definitely order uh, Steve's stuff online. But if you need immediate foam, come see us. And uh, picks them up here at U.S. Toy. All right. So uh, we, I saw Dragon Ball Z over there, and then I'm not sure if it's another Mandalorian helmet or is that a, a Fallout helmet back there as well? Uh, top here? No, down a level, right underneath where Vegeta was. Up here. Whoop. Oh, here. Up, oh, that's up, there. Uh, yeah. That's the uh, collector's edition. Uh, Fallout, Fallout seventy six, uh, power oh. power armor helmet. Uh, the they did a T fifty one helmet. Uh, okay. From that, so unfortunately didn't make that one. It's just a fun thing. I'm gonna repaint. Sure. No, the, those those are great. You know, I I, I don't think enough people do uh, a full on uh, power armor outfit that you can step in and out of. 
you know, how cool would that be that you walk out with like the, your your blue jumpsuit and everything else? You know, that's I've, if if I were a fabricator, that's where, right where I'd be. Uh, I've thought about it. It's it's been kind of mulling around in the brain meats for a while. Uh, pretty much mm -hmm. since four came out and they did that redesign of that power armor set, I've been thinking about it. It's uh, it'd definitely be cool. It's it's going to be a feat. Because you essentially need to build the the internal frame. Uh, there's a, a few, like two people that I've seen that do it, um, uh -huh. and they do a really good job of like like locking servos and then servos that open up the hinges in the back. Uh, so we'll we'll see. Maybe one day. Man, if if you do it, get in touch with me because I definitely want some video. Oh, I'd definitely. Love to promote <laughs> the, the crap out of that. That'd be awesome. Uh, so. Where do you get most of most of your inspiration to build? Because we've we've talked about WoW, we've talked about Fallout, we've talked anime, we've talked steampunk, we've we've talked Star Wars. You've got a lot of a lot of different interests, man. Where where do you uh, say this is this is where I want to build? This is what I want to focus. I primarily I I like to make things that I have invested interest and in, passion into. Um, with an exclusion of the Project Ebonblade stuff, while there was invested interest and passion, passion just to work with all those people, uh, I I haven't played World of Warcraft in a while since it came out in 2005 or whatever. Uh, sure. But uh, with a lot of the Star Wars stuff and the anime stuff, it's all it's all genres and series that I really really enjoy. Uh, and to bring bringing that stuff to life. Uh, little little crazy little trinkets or things like the armors, um, a lot of Star Wars stuff, just because I like a lot of Star Wars stuff. And there's uh, a lot of cool technology and a lot of cool dirt and grungy grime and uh, warm, warm warm side of distressing techniques to really like to implement, which also carries through to the Fallout universe. Uh, a lot of similar hues and things like that when you're adding your distressing between Star Wars and uh, and Fallout. Um, and then, like with the Protoss build, again, it's a game that I grew up playing and loving, and it's something that I really enjoy. So it's... Uh, I'll find genres and characters that I really like, kind of connect with and want to bring to life. And uh, then go from there and uh, building their armor or weapons or things like that. Very cool. So we we have talked a little bit about distressing, mm -hmm. and you're you're well known for distressing, and you talked about using oil paints. What are some of the things that uh, builders should pay attention to when they're distressing, and, and what kind of techniques should they really start focusing on? to become better distressors? So one thing, uh, so distressing and aging is actually one of the topics that we present panels on. Uh, and one of the things that I really like to take into consideration are uh, the, the base material that you're trying to emulate being metals or plastics or things like that, the weapons that are going to be striking it, um, the environment that it's going to be in, be it a a more Terran-based earthly environment that's got the the warmer colored dirts and oils and grimes and things like that, uh, or if you're going to be more in that futuristic society, uh, so it's got a kind of got colder tones to it, um, less dust accumulation. Uh, another thing that I also, especially in the Fallout and Star Wars universe, is uh, for the most part, black isn't a naturally occurring color. Even your dark oils and uh, grime and things like that, they're, they're varying shades of darker grays. Uh, so we'll typically, um, on armors and things like this, uh, which have a combination of different sands and dirts and uh, carbon buildup and things like that, uh, I use typically three shades of brown for most of my washes. Uh, there's a burnt, burnt and raw sienna, I believe, and then uh, raw umber. 
are the my three favorite browns. The I believe it's the raw umber that is more of a red orangey hue, which is really good for simulating rust. You can also just add real rust, which is really cool, um, with like iron filament and white glues. Um, but I'll 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 take primarily those three colors if we're just looking at dirt, and then go through either the prop or item. Um, like on this Vegeta armor specifically, you've got these these recessed areas where uh, dirt and water is actually going to accumulate. Um, and what's cool with certain paints, especially if you're using like a, a water-based paint and then distressing on top of it, you can you can apply or excuse me, oil paint on top of it for the distressing. You can apply your uh, apply your oils on the paint if you're on a rush, if it's if it's uh, sealed properly or if it has the right additives, and then just kind of buff it away so you get that actual rubbing high spot for the cleaner areas and in your recessed areas like here all that dirt is going to stay and live and you can build those different colors and hues up to uh, get a better emulation of the dirt and grime and all the the ooey gooey dusty stuff that you're trying to emulate from the, the atmosphere that your stuff is in if that makes sense sure absolutely that's fantastic uh, so you know, we're, we're coming to the end of our time before too long. I did want to say, uh, Dustin, we've got his contact information for the HDC fabrication. Uh, what does it take to get in touch with you to get uh, something commissioned? Where do you want Where do you want to send people to uh, to order something? Uh, pretty how does, much. How does that process go? Uh, when we have custom slots open, um, you can contact us via Facebook or there's a contact page on um, our website. Or also uh, email or Instagram, pretty much any social media, and then redirect you accordingly. Uh, and then it's just a matter of uh, for custom work, it's, uh, especially, kind of tell us what you're looking to do, and uh, we'll see if we can do it and get a budget if we have the slot open. Uh, custom work's closed right now, but uh, we do a lot of. Uh, pre-made items like a lot of the Mandalorian and some Star Wars stuff that we'll list on Etsy when we have spots available for that. Uh, also HDC fabrication on Etsy. Uh, but again, if there's any questions regarding custom work or uh, just fabrication techniques, guys are welcome to reach out to us and we can chat, chat shop, chat talk. Okay. All right. We, we've done a lot of business today. Let's do a little fun. Okay. What's the most wild thing you want to see happen in Mandalorian season two? Uh, wild thing in season two, like there's already been so much speculation out there. I would, it would, it would be cool to see Obi Wan Force Ghost pop up somewhere. Like if maybe if Ahsoka Tano comes out and like Force Ghost Obi Wan is trying to instruct her. Uh, or or the child, I don't know. Like crazy wild stuff that I haven't seen people speculate on. I think, especially since they've already been to Tatooine, like seeing seeing Force Ghost Obi, I think would be really cool. I don't think it's gonna happen. Uh, there's been so many other things that they've already talked about, including uh, like be it be it Rex or Boba or uh, Ahsoka. Um, Force, yeah, Force Ghost Obi somewhere I think would be nice. would be a good surprise somewhere, even if it's just kind of like a little thing in the back. Sure. So my my hairball uh, left field theory that I'd love to see come true in episode in uh, season two of of Mandalorian, Asaka Tano slowly transforms throughout the season. Into Maz Kanata. <laughs> okay. That I think that explains how she got the lightsabers and everything else, and I think it's a fun way of uh, showing a transition for that character. I think it'd be a lot of fun. Yeah, cause, uh, but cause, it's. Or I mean, it's not real whatsoever, but yeah. yeah, yeah, but it'd be fun. It'd be fun. It'd be ridiculous. Maybe that's a fan fiction, all right. <laughs> so. 
Hey, we want to thank all you guys for, for watching us today. Uh, Tim, thank you so much for sharing uh, with us your, your wisdom and knowledge. You, you've just done absolutely fantastic work, and I can hardly wait till it's time for, uh, for it to be safe in us to meet in person. Likewise. Um, thank you. I, I, I look forward to, to working with you. Hey, Dustin, you want to pop up our sponsors there real quick once again to thank them. Uh, we've got NFM. The Boulevard Brewing Company, U.S. Army, KCWE, GEICO, UMB Bank, Xfinity, 5-Hour Energy Team, Mobile, Kansas City Mavericks, Kansas City Live, and the great state of Oklahoma, as well as Letha and her team over there at U.S. Toy Magic and Costume Shop, open from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. every day right now. Come on in, see them. Check out the new TNT cosplay foam. Check out the stick effects mask. Check out the rock star wigs and add a magic trick to your cosplay. Gosh darn it. We got, we've got Zatanna stuff. Uh, thank you so much for, for all the tips and tricks. Thank you all for watching us here at PCKC TV. We appreciate your time, your energy. We look forward to seeing you all again in person. Bye guys. Thank Bye. you. Mission sequence start. Six, five,